Sherry Stridehorst and I'm a research scientist with Alberta Agriculture. I work at a barhead which is about an hour and a half northwest of Edmonton so this is I'm starting to make weekly trips to Lethbridge it seems. <laughs> what I'm going to talk about is um, loving plant growth regulators and the war with MRLs kind of keeping in this theme. We had a nice arts and craft day the other day to make it fit with this um, the, the wheat stock theme but I um, want to talk about plant growth regulators and um, I've talked about this a lot, so I apologize if you guys have heard me, but I think some of the excitement um, around PGRs is new now with uh, the MRL issue being resolved for manipulator, um, and that's a plant growth regulator that we're going to talk about. So it's now a realistic option for growers uh, because we can actually spray manipulator on our wheat and then sell it into the U.S. without um, any concerns about trade barriers. But I think it's important that we understand a bit about how PGRs work um, and what they are and, um, and how we are seeing them behave in our different production systems. Now, um, Brian talked about yield gaps. We talked about um, seeding rates. All of these things kind of build into this PGR talk. When we are looking at pushing crop yields higher and higher, we're looking at higher rates of fertility. We're looking at fungicides. But one of the things um, when we increase our fertility rates, uh, we tend to get lodging with that and that is something that we want to prevent with plant growth regulators so so we do have some options out there and um, as these options become more and more widespread um, and used in our cropping production systems it's important that we do the research and that you guys understand what we're seeing and how you guys can best implement them on your farm so I'm going to go through a bit of a blurb um, and then I want to spend some time on staging um, because the application of plant growth regulators needs to be at the right stage. If you get it on at the wrong stage, depending on the product, um, you can have less beneficial effects or you can have really negative yield reductions. And, and we don't want you guys experiencing that. Um, if someone, I think someone was going to go grab some um, young plants for me from, a, from some plots over there. So um, if someone could get those. Um, the shovels? I thought I saw some shovels here. I'll go. Okay. Yeah, if someone could grab some kind of growth stage 30, 32 plants, that would be terrific and we'll, we'll use those later on. Um, but let's talk about plant growth regulators and what they are. So what they are doing is they're impacting the plant's hormonal system. And um, there's five different um, classes of hormones in plants, or five major ones. Can anyone name one of those classes? And I don't have prizes, but you just have the, the honor of knowing the answer. Auxins, perfect. That was the first group of um, plant hormones that was discovered uh, back in 1934. Something like a 2,4-D herbicide apple, uh, mimics that kind of activity. So that's a really great one. Another one, that's kind of... Uh, Gibberellins, perfect. Now that's the ones that our manipulator um, type plant growth regulators are inhibiting. So what gibberellins do is they um, make cells larger is one of their, their things. They do a lot of other things in the plant. There's actually over 125 different known gibberellins, but they are made, um, there's a lot of intermediaries to making these um, in the plant. Some of them are active and some of them are not. And what a, a product like manipulator does, it inhibits active gibberellins and it prevents that plant from stretching up. So when we're talking about lodging, we want to keep things shorter. So um, a, a longer cell, of course, makes it taller. When you have a big, heavy wheat head at the top of a plant that's tall, that's going to sway a lot more than one that's lower down in the canopy. So that's kind of some of the thinking behind that, um, that, that process. Um, they actually, gibberellins were kind of the next um, plant hormones that were found and they found them because they had rice infected with a fungus that was releasing gibberellins and what they found, the, the visual uh, on this was plant, rice plants that were really tall. So, so that's the exact thing that we're trying to prevent is to keep those plants short and compact. Another class of plant hormones. This isn't ethanol named after a hormone? Yes, it is, Brian. So, um, ethanol, the active ingredient is ethafon, and what that does is it releases kind of a ripening hormone in the plant. Um, and that is the other class of plant hormones that work very differently from the gibberellin biosynthesis inhibitors. And um, 
those have different timings for applications and things like that. Um, but th if you can think about a common use for that, when they pick bananas right or, or green down um, in those climates where they grow bananas, and then they send them up here to grocery stores and they put ethylene on those bananas to cause them to ripen and turn yellow. So, so plant hormones are in um, all of our food production systems, um, but they haven't been used widely in our Western Canadian cropping production. And, and they're becoming more and more important as we um, intensify our production systems and need to keep these crops standing. So there's a lot of different types of plant growth regulators. What we're going to focus on today are the ones that keep your crop standing and reduce that lodging. So I um, want to just talk a little bit about lodging. Um, lodging, depending on when it happens, um, can cause some different, um, different problems for you. If you get lodging uh, from the time of anthesis, that flowering time to 20 days after, you can cause yield losses of 7 to 35%. So um, that's a bad time to have lodging. Certainly you don't want that. And um, think of it as this is, um, I don't know how well, and these are plots, so I don't want to pull them out. Um, but think of this stem and it kinks over because it lodged in a windstorm or a rainstorm. Thinking ab about this as your straw from McDonald's, that's preventing water and nutrients from coming up into the head, into the leaves um, to make photosynthesates and then yield, which is what you guys are concerned about. So we want to keep this standing. We don't want that. The other thing that we get is when we get lodging, um, when our grain is ripe, um, you have nice ripe heads that you've got a bad storm, um, Prior, just prior to harvest, you have grain sitting on the ground in wet soil conditions. You're going to get sprouting, you're going to get disease forming on that, and the harvest headaches. No one likes putting rocks through their combines. Um, and um, so some of this is, is um, depends on the cultivar. So we know, of course, that some cultivars stand better than others. And what we've got behind us here, um, there's a number of different cultivars, um, some Durham, um, some CPS, or sorry, CWRS wheat cultivars. And what they are doing is looking at how different cultivars respond to plant growth regulators. We know that different cultivars have, some have a good rating for standability, have, some have um, a poor rating, um, some have a very good, if you look um, with that really tall one, I believe, um, what's the, the tag on that guy right there? Yes. Jithara. Oh, I shouldn't stand there. And it's um, a, a VB, which means it's a varietal blend and it's a midge tolerant cultivar. And a lot of the midge tolerant cultivars um, actually are really tall and that's a problem for standability. So um, there are some new genetics that are kind of trying to address that in Landmark, which is a cultivar too, but really a problem with those midge tolerant cultivars. Um, the growth stage, we talked that that critical period is that 20 days after anthesis so that you want to keep that standing because that's when we suffer the biggest yield losses. And then when we have wind and rainstorms like we had last night, I, I go out to my plots, I see those and I can't sleep, but I'm hoping I get that in the plots, not in your surrounding fields, of course. Um, but I'm hoping to see lodging so that we can select and get that best combination of genetics and plant growth regulators to keep that crop standing for you. Um, the other thing that we get is disease um, impacting the integrity of the stem and that's particularly true in a crop like peas. Um, Ascochyta microsporella can damage the base of that plant and um, it falls over. Plant growth regulators are not working in peas so just to put that out there but we are trying that um, to look at standability issues for these crops so that we can push yields and maximize yields. So um, these are the different varieties that we have growing here. Um, probably the, the variety that you guys are most familiar with is just on the outside of the tent here. Um, I think I, I see Dave Corey, and maybe I should introduce him if you want to just give him a wave. He is um, with Engage Agro, and they are the ones who are selling and marketing manipulator here in Canada. So also a great resource um, to talk to. And these are their plots here, and looking at how different cultivars will respond to plant growth regulators. Um, what we've got here is Brandon um, just over there. So how many of you guys are growing Brandon or familiar with the variety? Seeing lots and lots of hands popping up. Um, last year, uh, 
and seed supplies were probably limiting acres, but in Western Canada, grown on 24% of the acres in Western Canada. This is a variety that is commanding a lot of acres, but also in these intensive systems where we're pushing fertility, we have the moisture, it's seeing standability issues. So not in this plot right here, but I have talked to growers um, in Southern Alberta here who are actually shutting off the water on their Brandon to keep it standing. And that is not something we want to do um, it, it, because of course that's going to limit yield. So we want to look at the other agronomic tools that we have to keep that standing so you can push your water and push your fertility to push your yields. Um, I've got plots uh, up in my area um, around Edmonton and what we do is we apply plant growth regulators and then we measure the height of them uh, 14 days after application of that plant growth regulator, we found um, that the manipulator caused a 10% height reduction, which is, is, is good. Um, but really at the end of the day, um, plant growth regulators, you see these visual differences. Um, on your left, there is um, the treated one, and then you have the untreated uh, on each variety with manipulator, and you see that height difference. But really effectiveness with a plant growth regulator is when you get that standability. Um, unless you're trying to manage straw, if you have a variety that has good genetics, maybe something um, like a, a uh, a pen hold wheat, really good standability, maybe you shorten it a bit, but if it's standing already, you don't need the PGR. So I think my message is, is that a PGR is not for every acre, not for every variety, it's for varieties that tend to lodge, um, but not all, if you have variety that lodges really bad, um, there's a variety called Coleman and Thorsby. Um, they're not big acre varieties, but they fall over and a plant growth regulator doesn't help them stand up sufficiently. So, so don't think that you can take terrible genetics and fix it with a plant growth regulator. You need a base of good genetics, um, something like a brand and, and then layer that PGR on top to, to help it stand. So, um, Maybe what we should do is actually, so we are seeing that different varieties respond differently because they have those different genetics. Um, right now, plant growth regulators are only registered for use on wheat. So manipulator is registered for use on wheat. Ethyl is registered for use on wheat. Um, there is nothing right now registered for use on barley or oats or um, peas for that matter. And we want to focus on, um, if you guys have heard of the Keep It Clean campaign, this is a movement uh, from Cereals Canada about making sure we only apply products that are registered and um, products that are, and we're using them at the correct grow stage. Uh, we Engage Agro um, registered manipulator in Canada. Um, in 2013, PMRA gave the check marks, we're all good. What happened though was there was not an MRL or a maximum residue limit for the active ingredient and manipulator into the US. When we think of how much grain goes south of the border, if they find manipulator residues in that wheat south of the border, that could close borders and we do not need any more trade problems with the US or any of our other trading partners for that matter. And just on that Keep It Clean campaign, um, want to reinforce the importance of following the label directions on glyphosate, um, particularly pre-harvest. Um, the label says you need to spray that when there is less than 30% seed moisture content. That's in the entire field. You're not using your glyphosate or you shouldn't be using your glyphosate when you've got that low green spot that you want to hurry up so you can get to the rest of the field because the world and our trading partners are looking at residue levels and we want to make sure we do not disturb trade uh, in any markets because we we grow so much here, we can't eat it here. And to be profitable in ag, we need to keep those trading relationships open and, um, and working for us. We don't want to damage those relationships. Um, so that's my, my piece on keep it clean and making sure we follow the label. Um, but since then, uh, Manipulator did um, in April 2018, so this spring, there was an MRL established in the United States for this product, which means growers now can use this product and ship their grain into the U.S. assuming they're following label directions. So, so that's really encouraging. So now there are two PGRs for use um, in Western Canada for use on wheat. So your Manipulator product, which inhibits, inhibits inhibits gibberella and biosynthesis, and then our ethyl, um, which um, affects the ethylene production in the plant. And both are intended to make the crop shorter and to make it stand. Um, but stage, if there's one thing we've learned about um, PGRs, oh, I shouldn't go here. Could someone pass me a knife maybe from that table? 
Staging is, thank you, is really, really critical. Um, one of the things with ethyl, the one that inhibits gibberellin biosynthesis, your application window for that is gross stage, let me just get this absolutely right, um, 37 to 45. So that's the time when that flag leaf is rolled until it flips over and you have ons poking out uh, of the boot there at only in 10% of the plant. So when I get a call saying I've got 10% of the ons out, I want to spray ethyl, I don't have product, it's windy, there's rain forecast, don't do it. Staging is critical. Um, the other thing to emphasize how critical staging is on ethyl, um, Quattro Farms, some of you guys are probably familiar with them. Um, Jack has told me they will go in, spray the high tops of their field, or the, the parts of their field that are more advanced, so those higher elevation areas, and they will come back 24 to 48 hours later to hit that at the right grow stage. You don't do that if staging isn't absolutely critical. And I think that goes back to that conversation about the higher seeding rates to make sure we have uniformity. Um, if you spray ethyl, it does state on the label, if you spray it early, you're going to start getting a whole bunch of new tillers that are gonna suck yield. So if you're spraying at that flag leaf timing, that's your end of June, kind of um, middle of June, depending on where you are in the province. Imagine getting a new flush of five tillers on every plant at that grow stage. What is that going to do for your yield? Bad things, right? So with ethyl, because staging is so critical, uh, you have to sign a waiver when you buy that product saying, when I screw up, it's my problem, my fault. So I do, ethyl can be a beautiful product, but staging is so critical and it should really only be used on very even fields and by people who know what they're doing and who have planned for it. Um, the, then we move to manipulator. And um, so this is the gibberellin biosynthesis inhibitors. And what's nice about them is on the label, they are um, registered for use between growth stage 12 um, so that's uh, the two leaf stage and I believe on the table back there we actually have a nice list that Jamie printed out of what the grow stages are and what they look like. So from the two leaf stage to um, grow stage 39 which is the flag leaf timing. Um, so that's a very wide window of application and that's for crop safety. To really make your PGR work well you want to get it on at grow stage 30 to 32 and you guys, I, I know Tom's an expert at grow staging because he's been to so many of my tours. He could probably do this um, but that's a critical little window and um, it's not about counting leaves um, it is about pulling out individual plants and and taking a look at it and you want to actually remove the tillers when you're doing this staging so here we've got we've got a high seeding right here because we only have one tiller which is lovely we're gonna pull that off and we're gonna count how many leaves are on this plant one two three four leaves and um, we've got the knife here and this staging does require you to, oh, they've got the safety on for me. You probably don't trust me with a knife. I'd probably have to fill out paperwork being a government employee to use this. So don't tell anyone, okay guys? Jerry, you may have wanted the cutting thing here. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yes, I probably should use the cutting board. Your wife has trained you well. <laughs> Okay, they're very nice tables. Um, so what we are doing is cutting the base of this stem and we are looking for, for the little tiny head in here and I, I didn't actually cut high enough here. But you are looking for that head and, um, and I did a poor job of cutting because I have an audience. Um, but we are looking for that head when it moves from this base node up one centimeter. That's growth stage 31. When you have one node here and your head is right there, that's the sweet spot to get this on. That's when you're gonna have the most efficacy with this product. Um, that's what we want you guys to do. So what I've got with the spinning wheel here is we have all these different growth stages. Um, so I, I, I'm going to ask for some volunteers to spin the wheel and um, then I have the different grow stages that correspond and you get to put it on the picture with the correct grow stage. And I know this is intimidating, so I will help anyone. Can I have a volunteer to, to try? And spinning the wheel is rewarding in itself. <laughs> <laughs> volunteers here. I'm, okay, spin the wheel here, my friend. Sorry, what's your name? Blaine. Blaine, Blaine spin the wheel. Do you feel like you're on a game show? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
<laughs> yeah. Growth stage 33. Okay, so that's kind of that when that end of that window when you want to apply your PGR, um, your gibberellin biosynthesis PGR like a, a manipulator. So here's your tag. So um, I haven't gone through this, so let's go through it together. So growth stage 31 is when your head is one centimeter above that first node. Growth stage 33 is when you have the first node, the second node, and the third node. So, so that's what we're going to look for in these pictures, and this might be a good picture to look at, I might recommend. Um, you've got your base node, but there's your first node, your second node, your th and your third node right here. So I would, that's growth stage 33. So, so the, it is complicated, and you can't just look at your plants um, driving by. You do have to pull them out. So if you want to stick that, that on there... And thank you for being a good sport. Um, but this staging is really critical. Um, the other thing that gets confusing with the staging is when you have a plant with four tillers and you kind of look at it and you go, hmm, well, I, too bad I don't have any with four tillers, but we can have four tillers and that plant looks very different than a plant with one tiller, but they can be at the same grow stage. And that's where this confusion starts. So always take your plant, pull off your tillers, and cut that. Um, and we do have a, a lot of knives and cutting boards for people to try this. I have one with three, Sherry. Yes. You've got one with three tillers? Perfect. Mm -hmm. Three tillers and a main stem. Is there any way this could be at growth stage 31? It, no. It could be, Brian. Uh, you spoke up, so how about you come up and you cut the plant? <laughs> right, we, maybe we shouldn't give Brian the knife, so. <laughs> no, Brian, if, do you want to come up and give it a try? No, I'll let a farmer try. Okay. We got any producers who want to give this a try? Because I'm sorry, but staging with this, guys, is something that um, comes with practice, and it's really important to stage this way. Okay, thank you. So I pulled off your tillers. So you want to just cut it lengthwise. So I'm guessing you might want to start up there. Just split it like... Yeah, exactly. Split it, split it lengthwise. It's, it's, oh, yeah, you've got it right there. Yeah, you're two to three centimeters, but we want to look to see if you have another node below that. So you found the head and that's the starting point, but then it's very possible you could be at growth stage 32 because you have another node between that head and the base. So, so you're looking for that tiny little head in there and, and how far that has moved up. And the idea is um, when you have your head up at the top, you can't reverse that growth. PGRs will not reverse growth. They will only prevent new elongation. Thank you very much for helping. So when we spray PGRs at the right time, we sometimes get some weird stuff happening because of the environment. Um, on the labels of both ethereal and manipulator, it says do not use if under heat stress, drought stress, uh, any other kind of stress that's causing to this plant, don't do it. Um, when we talked about those five groups of hormones in the plant, um, one can impact another and we can get a lot of strange things going on. And when a plant is under drought stress, heat stress, it's doing different hormonal things and you add another curveball there with your plant growth regulator, you can see yield decreases. Um, the, the one thing that is most consistent with PGRs across all different crop types is if you spray it under hot, dry conditions, you'll get yield decreases. And the, the nice thing about that, if there is a nice thing, is PGRs are intended for those environments where we have high moisture, high fertility, where we're going to have lodging. If you have dry drought conditions, you're not going to be trying to manage lodging because um, the weather will be doing that for you. So you can take that perspective on it that um, don't do it and Mother Nature will be your plant growth regulator in those, in those situations.
Um, some of the things that we see and we don't maybe see every year, um, last year in my environment, we saw three to five days later maturity with our plant growth regulator. Um, we can see increases in tillering. That's not what we want to have. Um, in Europe, uh, they are using, in the UK in particular, they're using 1.7 applications of PGR a year. So they're going in twice. And um, some of them are using on barley uh, a manipulator type product to increase tillering. So when you put it on can cause very different impacts. So if our intention is to, as we've talked, we don't want tillering, we want to keep that uniform, we want to achieve that with our plant stand and apply our plant growth regulator at the time when it's going to shrink the height of that plant. Um, so we can see um, shifting assimilates to the roots because this plant is growing and it um, all of a sudden has extra sugars. Let's put it into roots. If you put it on at the wrong time, it can put those resources into tillers. So really staging is, is so particular on this. Um, we have occasionally seen protein reductions with PGR use. And um, in most of your wheat classes, um, in a CPS, maybe in a soft white, that's not critical. But if you are in a CWRS wheat and you go a small change from 13.1 to 12.9 on your protein, not cool for marketing. Um, we have also seen though on the plus side, if you follow that up with a fungicide application, we can see that disappear. And um, I think the nice thing about that is in a PGR system, that's in a system where you're pushing fertility. If you're using a PGR, you're probably using a fungicide anyways. Um, so that, that problem might um, take care of itself, but it's important to know that it is a possible side effect. You can mix the two. Let's talk about mixing the two. Um, so, uh, okay, so we want to get the staging right. So some people want to tank mix their PGR with their herbicide. You want to be spraying your herbicide before you're at growth stage 30, 32. So not the right timing for that. Um, then if you're spraying at flag leaf timing, that might work for an ethyl type of product to tank mix it then. But if you're spraying at your FHB timing or your early flowering, not the right timing, you're too late. Um, so really the sweet spot for a, a manipulator product is to spray it at growth stage 30 to 32, which is probably a week to a week and a half after your, um, after your herbicide timing and a couple weeks before your flag leaf fungicide timing. So we are doing a little bit of looking at using a product like a Triva Pro, which has um, three different actives that gives you a bit longer window of protection. Tank mixing a fungicide like that at the PGR timing, maybe skipping your flag leaf fungicide timing and coming in later with a, a head timing fungicide. So a Procero at that timing. So that's something we're looking at. Um, we don't, this is the first year of the trials. We don't know, we have seen visual benefits from that. Will that translate into yield? We really don't know. So that's one of the things we are looking at because I know no one wants to spend more time in their sprayer than what they are spending already. Um, but if we're going to move to these intensive systems where we're pushing field yields above 100 bushels on our wheat, um, that separate pass might just be critical for our PGRs. And I think Ken has something very exciting to show Not us. Not really. I was just going to ask you, actually. Is this the head right here that's popped out or another leaf? You know what? I, I'm not seeing the heads well in this. I actually wonder... If it's down I think it's actually right here. Right. Yeah, that's it right there. And they were asking, where would you consider the node then? So... So this one here, um, the head has not elongated at all. So you've got a plant that's stretched up this high and your head is still at the base. So it's, so this is growth stage 30 when there's no elongation from that basal node until you see the head. So, so this is one of those things. So when you find this in your field, you get, you get that, um, you get ready to spray it in the next five to seven days, but you keep watching it. So, so great example there. Well, no, I guess my question was, sorry, how late can you go with a combination? How late can you go with and a combination? And yourself yet still keep it short. So it does depend on your product. So on your manipulator, um, you are registered till flag leaf. That's, that's what the label says. But we also have to remember that by the time you've reached flag leaf, your, your plant has done a lot of, a lot of that elongation and, and we're not going to reverse that. So 
Um, define, Sherry, define flag leaf. Flag leaf? Like I was told as long as your flag leaf stick straight up, you're still okay. Yes. Once it starts. But, but we're going to, the further we get from that growth stage 30 to 32, the less effective we are. So, so you will be safe, but it's not going to be quite as good as going early. So, so if you get in a, sist a situation where you can't get it on at the 30 to 32 because of weather conditions or, or whatever, um, that is certainly an option that is on label. But don't go later than that. So at that timing, you could look at, at tank mixing with your, with your fungicide for flag leaf application there. So if you spray late, you're just wasting your money. You're far more, so that's with your manipulator. Um, with a product like Ethryl, you need to have that flag leaf. So, so you're actually going later with Ethryl because they're working very differently. But same thing, if you're late with it, you're... So Ethryl works very differently and, and um, can be really nice when you hit the right growth stage. So I wouldn't say you're wasting your money with Ethryl going at that timing at all. It's just a different product that works very differently if that, that makes sense. <coughs> so any other questions? See, the reason I'm asking, we did some yep. strips with twin line and... Twin line, okay. And uh, manipulate. Okay, and tank mix and at flag. Just, just when the flag leaf was starting to poke up. Yeah. Yeah, so, so you are within label there, which is good. And maybe, um, Dave, because in my experiments, I'm not targeting the boundaries, um, but maybe Dave can comment on that. So with manipulator, when you spray it, you'll shorten the part of the plant that's developing at that time. So the sweet spot of growth stage 30 to 32, you'll shorten and strengthen that first and second inner node, which is the base of the plant right off the soil surface. By the time you get to the third and fourth inner node, they'll continue on long and lanky. So if you wait until spraying at flag leaf stage, your first and second have already lengthened. You're going to shorten and strengthen that plant, but you're going to shorten and strengthen it further up the stalk. So you shorten and strengthen the third and fourth internode. In my head, I want to give you the strongest foundation I can with that plant so that third week of July, when that wind and rain comes from the west and starts to do this, this is stronger and shorter down here, so it's got more chance of coming back up. If I didn't do that, could this still kink over on me? And as soon as it kinks, I can't get moisture and nutrients up to the head. So sweet spot is absolutely that 30 to 32 growth stage, which is roughly five and six leaf. And that takes away from what Sherry's doing because growth stage 30 to 32 is, is the accurate way to measure this. You know what, Dave? Our farm would love a wind and a two inch rain today. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll take that today. Yeah, I don't yes. think anyone would complain about that. Um, so the one thing that I haven't talked about, um, so we've talked about manipulator, we've talked about ethyl. There is a new PGR coming from Syngenta with the active ingredient of Trinexapac ethyl. It's working on the gibberellin inhibition, so it also will be applied at that growth stage 30 to 32. Um, it's a product that's more effective on barley. And um, we've taken it one step further in the research is we're actually starting to tank mix. And this is off label, so I don't want anyone going across the border and buying Trinexapac and bringing it back and tank mixing with manipulator because um, we do not want to do anything against trade barriers. But in research, we're trying to figure this out for when it is um, registered. Tank mixing the two active ingredients is where we're getting a lot of consistency um, with the performance. Um, and that's, I think, really where we want to go. And performance on barley. If, if you guys, if a crop is going to lodge first, it's going to be barley is going to fall over before your wheat because the genetics aren't as good. But the tank mix of that Trinexapac and that manipulator together on barley is really showing some very exciting progress um, in terms of reducing height, but also the standability. Uh, yeah, Half question. Rates of each or full rates of each? So, so we're playing, um, we know the economics of full rates of each are pretty tough. Um, so we're looking at the combinations of 25% manipulator, 75% Trinexapac, the opposite, 50% of each and 75% of each um, label rate. So, so that's where we've seen incredible benefits. And, and this is something that's developing and coming with time. On barley though, um, this might be a solution for feed. Um, so far, the maltsters don't like glyphosate. What, so what do you think they think of PGRs? 
probably not so cool, right? Um, so they are working with us, which is encouraging to have that involvement. Uh, Canada Malt's involved in the project and we'll be doing micro malt testing on the Copeland and Synergy barley that we've treated with this. So we can at least get some numbers um, and you know, time will tell where that goes, but it's good to have them involved in the research at this stage right now. So does anyone have any questions? I feel like I've been talking a lot. The later you go, you, you see the MRLs higher. So, so yeah, um, so that's, I think that's an important thing is that, that um, when we get to that flag leaf timing, you don't want to go after because the plant has less time to process that and break it down and make sure we're below the MRL levels. Um, Dave was mentioning that um, some growers are applying it on a, a barley silage, it's not registered on barley, and then you're cutting it before you get to maturity. So we don't actually know what those levels are. But I've heard of guys who I do not agree, they're going triple rate on this and they're finding really high rates in the grain. So following the label, and that's even when it's supplied at the right time. So we want to stay within the label rates as well so we don't get those residues showing up any higher than what the maximum residue levels are that are approved. So why would they want to do that if, if the one times does it? Because they want to try stuff. Oh. A and um, yeah, spend money. and spend money. And sometimes when we get um, farmers who have immigrated from Europe and they're used to these multiple things and they just want to throw everything at their crop that they possibly can, and we need to be careful on that. So yeah, and and yeah, when you're in an environment where lodging is a problem. On Brandon, I have had growers call me and say they want to go in with manipulator at growth stage 30, 32, and then come back with ethyl at the flag leaf because standability, and that's under irrigation where they're pushing fertility and everything else. But um, that would be a system where, yeah, that would be okay to do that. Um, but you're using two different products at the right time at the right rate, which would be a far better option than going off label at the wrong time or the wrong rate. It's fascinating. Yeah, so that's that's kind of my blurb. But um, if anyone wants to do some practice, wants to spin the spinning wheel just for fun, um, cut some plants and do some staging and look for that head, because uh, this is um, not the easiest thing to stage for. So so more practice, the better. Um, if they're both spread at the optimum time, does one yeah. have a lodging or yield advantage? A lodging or yield advantage, the manipulator versus the ethereal. Um, I, I guess Bear has told me, Sherry, please don't use ethereal anymore because you'll end up promoting it and we don't want any more acres <laughs> being sprayed with ethereal because we don't want to deal with the train wrecks. So I haven't done the head-to-head the -head comparisons in all fairness. Yeah. And ethereal is an old product. It was discovered in 1965, so it's not new technology. And growers who know what to do with it will keep doing it because it, it does work very well because they know how to manage that field and they've got the evenness. Sherry, yeah. what, what would you say, what temperature would you say is, is heat stress? Yeah, okay, sure. Um, what was the question, Sherry? So, so the question is, what temperature would you consider heat stress? So what I've got here um, are, are 10 different site years um, and in red is where we actually saw um, a yield reduction because we had heat stress. Um, but what it seems to be is a bit of the combination of temperature and humidity. So we had when the PGR was applied at 17 degrees Celsius, so not crazy hot, but 42% humidity and that seemed to be causing a, the yield reduction. Um, when we have soil moisture that's at 7.8, when you're going into spring seeding under nice moisture conditions, your soil moisture is at about 25%. So this was really dry soil. We, we saw that one coming. But 17 degrees in the lower humidity was a bit of a surprise. And we don't have um, the consistency of this figured out, but any sort of stress when you don't have ideal growing conditions, I would, I would steer clear of it because you're also, the risk of lodging is a lot less as well. So I wish I had a really nice textbook. This is it, but um, the humidity, the dry soil, and the hot temperatures. So when we sprayed it um, at, I, I thought, 
it, we, we had a future year and we sprayed it when it was 32 degrees. We knew we were doing bad things, but it was research, so we do it just so that we have those numbers. Um, yeah, I, I think definitely um, going with, not in the heat of the day is probably not a, a bad idea. Yeah. More early morning, like there's... We haven't, we, we just don't have the consistency. So that's one of the things with the PGRs we are finding. The more we do, the more questions we get. And, and it's those inconsistencies and we can't directly tie it back it's not tying back directly to soil moisture unless it's the extremes, then we can do it. But it's that middle part where we're yeah. kind of struggling to, to get those exact recommendations. So more work is what we need to do and get that out to you guys. Yeah. Under dry line and good growing conditions, but it's not gonna lodge yet. Is yeah. there a yield advantage to using this just to put more energy into the head? I, I No, we haven't. Mostly when you see the yield advantage, it is because you're preventing lodging. Um, I can, um, that's kind of the big thing. Um, there are some reports when occasionally you do the get that, but not consistently. And that's where I think our recommendations from research, we want to make sure it's consistently happening. So, um, yeah, I think that's what I've got. Um, for timing, I'm not sure where we're at, but we can probably spend a couple minutes here looking at plants, looking at staging, and if you guys ha want to ask some questions one-on-one, -on -one, we can certainly, certainly do that.